Good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds. It's a very special Grand Rounds for several reasons today. Number one, it's our kickoff day for interviews, so I want to welcome the applicants uh, uh, to Michigan. You can tell they're sitting out in the back. Welcome. And also, it's the I would say the last day that I'm going to be up here as interim chair, so to speak, but really uh, a wonderful opportunity to introduce our incoming chair. Uh, we all know Dr. Williscroft had sent out an announcement, it's probably now a couple of months, but I think it's really important to remind ourselves of who our new chair is, and that's John Carruthers. And I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to introduce him in a formal way to our audience. So we had done some of this at our last faculty meeting, but it's a large group, so I'm going to share some specifics about John. Uh, John and I go back a few years, actually. John originates from Detroit and went to Cass, went to Wayne, did medical school training there also, then went to the East Coast of Boston to Mass General to do internal medicine training. And I first became familiar with John in 19... That's a little bit ago, 1992, when he came to join us as a fellow in gastroenterology here at the University of Michigan. And since then, we have been uh, colleagues and friends over the years. John, after completing his fellowship here in gastroenterology, and at the time was working with Rick Boland, and as many things happen in academia, they're moving parts and transitions. Rick went out to San Diego and knew at that point that uh, he wanted to take John with him, because that was... Uh, part of his uh, future too. And John moved with him to the University of California, San Diego, became assistant professor there, and rapidly moved through the ranks to professor of medicine. And during that time, really excelled in multiple domains and held multiple leadership positions. He initially was fellowship director of the gastroenterology program, then became division chief of the unit at the VA uh, for gastroenterology, and then Division Chief at the University of California, San Diego for Gastroenterology. During all of this time, he also pursued basic science investigation and colon cancer biology. And we'll have John present his work here in one of our grand rounds in the near future. Uh, in addition to all of this, he has been nationally recognized for his multiple uh, discoveries, his dedication to education and development of, of young scholars, really very involved in our national associations at multiple fronts recognized by his peers as an outstanding investigator, and this is, again, our best testament to that is the uh, granting, and he held, holds a U54, has held multiple R01 grants, and then finally his commitment to the development of our young learners through participation, again, in some of our key academic scholars program at a national level in uh, our associations. He's published over 65 peer-reviewed publications, I think, 28 book chapters, multiple abstracts, and sits on several editorial boards. So uh, it's really a delight to now, in this position, to welcome back uh, a former student, if you will, who, to take the reins of our department. As I tell the applicants, uh, Michigan tends to hold on to people, and if it doesn't hold on to them, it brings them back. So with that, please welcome me. Uh, well, uh, let's welcome John with a, a round of applause. Thank, th thank you, John. I'm going uh, to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank John for the outstanding job he has done as interim chair in a very public way. Uh, I have a lot to learn coming back to Michigan. It's been almost 15 years since I've been here, and some things have changed. Some things have stayed the same, but you know what? It's t it keeps getting better. I even uh, put on a Michigan tie today to, to show um, uh, my... Uh, allegiance to the, to the university here. Um, it's fantastic to be back. I am glad to be back. Um, Michigan's always had a warm place in my heart. Uh, and when the opportunity came up to uh, come and visit uh, this place again, I jumped at the chance and uh, went through the process. And so here I am. I will uh, hopefully meet most of you over the next several months. Um, I intend to give a grand rounds, as uh, John mentioned, uh, probably after the new year when there's an opening, um, and tell you about little, uh, the stuff that I do. Hopefully, I can continue doing that as uh, the chair, but we'll see. Um, uh, I intend to do that, um, and uh, I thank you for your welcome. So I don't want to take too much more time. Thanks. Thanks, John. You're welcome. All right. So.
I'll take the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Carrie Engelberg. And Carrie's looking at the clock. Are we doing okay here? We're doing okay. <laughs> I want to introduce him instead of putting John there, because I know Carrie, and we go back a while. Very briefly, Carrie is a faculty member, a long-standing faculty member, did his uh, graduate and uh, undergrad study at George Washington, actually spent time at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine for a period of time, was an EIS officer, some of us didn't know this, but uh, for two years, and actually spent a fair amount of time abroad as a Peace, off, Peace Corps officer, places as Central Africa, Bangladesh, and Indonesia. Came to the University of Michigan in 1986 as assistant professor, rose through the ranks, became a division chief for infectious diseases, and throughout this time was interested in pursuing the molecular techniques of understanding uh, infectious disorders. Uh, in 2005, Kerry took a slight turn and really began to focus on education and really has blended his love for education and combining it with his desire to serve international populations, and that's what we'll hear about today. Kerry has been recognized worldwide for his accomplishments uh, with over 70 publications, multiple book chapters, and it's a delight to welcome Kerry. The topic today is Enhancing Health Education in Africa, the Potential of Electronic Learning Resources. Thank you. Good morning. Silence. Uh, well, if we were in Ghana right now and I were giving this talk in Ghana, about 90% of you would have verbalized good morning back to me. So let's try again. Good morning. Good morning. Great. So now everybody knows what it's like to be outside of their cultural comfort zone. And we can start with that. Good. Well, uh, the part that I have in, in in the, in the great big wide world of, de of helping development in the developing world is very small. And so I'm going to take a reductionist view to this and start with some comments about health in general in Africa and the economy there and what part health and health education play in that. And then uh, go on to talk about some of the efforts that uh, originate here at the University of Michigan to enhance human resources for health and then focus on the, the major topic of this uh, discussion which is electronic learning programs in health education uh, there and what, what potential role they would have. So let me start with some big picture ideas here that uh, many of you may be familiar with, but uh, some may not. This is a recent uh, look at total fertility rates in the world. And the highest fertility rates are the ones that are in red and orange. And as you can see, um, most of the, uh, the increased fertility in the world right now is occurring in Africa where the fertility rates are like four to, four to five. That means each woman is producing at least four to five children. Whereas in the rest of the world, it has undergone what has been called the demographic transition. So people have stopped having uh, babies at huge rates and started uh, controlling the population. Uh, the result of this is that by the year 2050, it's estimated that the African population will triple unless something is done. The problem with this is that Africa can't support all those people. And for capita, per capita food production in Africa is actually declining, whereas it's going up in the rest of the world, partially because of uh, more modern agricultural techniques that haven't been developed there. Well, this leads to uh, the situation that the a, a billion people in this world find themselves in, which has been referred to by Jeffrey Sachs, the economist, as the poverty trap. And it consists of problems with uh, water resources and uh, other natural resources, the static food production that I talked about, ultimately environmental degradation because there's so little, there's a tendency to overuse what, what there is, poor health, and I'll have more obviously to say about this and how this plays into the poverty trap, high fertility rates and civil conflict. And in fact, all these things are related to one another so that they produce a kind of a vicious cycle. So, for example, uh, poor health may be associated with not enough food and malnutrition or with environmental degradation. And it's felt that, uh, that the expectation that a certain number of one's children are going to die is associated with the high fertility rates. So when uh, economies reach a stage where people don't have that fear anymore, the population tends to adjust itself and the fertility rates go down. Now, the problem of having a high fertility rate in, in, in a place like Africa with an, with an enlarging population is that the median age of the population goes down. So what you have is a lopsided population where you have a lot of very young people and when you, when you uh, add 
a lot, particularly males, a lot of unemployed males that don't have any economic future, uh, and uh, not very many older people to give them reasonable uh, guided direction, uh, you run the possibility of having civil conflicts. And that's how you wind up with young males who are willing to strap uh, bombs on themselves and go into marketplaces. This is something we would like to avoid. And all of these things uh, add together to create a problem with extreme poverty. Now, while I was in Ghana, uh, President Obama made a visit to Ghana. And this is a, a, a highway leading in from Accra, the main highway that leads in from Accra to Kumasi, where, where I was spending most of my time. I have to say, most of the highways don't look like this. Actually, you get a few miles out of town, it's very different. But uh, there, here, here's a sign welcoming uh, uh, the president and his wife. Akwaba means welcome in, in tree. Uh, even though he didn't come to this site, they decided to put up a sign. Now, when, when uh, President Obama was in uh, Africa, he made a very interesting speech in, in Ghana in which he outlined what he thought some of the problems for development of the continent were. And uh, one of the things, one of the comparisons he drew wasn't about Ghana, it was about Kenya, where his ancestors come from. And he compared Kenya and South Korea back in the 50s because they were economically in pretty much the same situation at that time. But since then, there's been a great big difference between what has transpired in Africa and what transpired in, in South Korea. So that uh, now I'm going to compare Ghana to South Korea. So this is, this is what the differences are. There's a huge disparity in gross uh, national income per capita. Uh, the fertility rate is about four times higher in Ghana than it is in South, uh, South Korea. The cereal yields are about one-fourth of what they are in South Korea, and partly that's due to the use of uh, fertilizers and modern agricultural techniques that haven't been introduced in Ghana. But when you go back and you look for the potential reasons for this, after uh, the Korean War, the United States pumped huge amounts of money, $65 per inhabitant in South Korea, compared to $2 per inhabitant in Ghana. So there hasn't been the huge influx of aid in, aid in African countries that would have allowed them to kickstart their economy the way the South Koreans have. And there, can be, there are multiple reasons for this that I won't go into today. But to look at some basic health indicators, the disparities uh, persist. So the life expectancy in Ghana is around 46 at birth, whereas it's 79 in South Korea. You have uh, differences in infant mortality and uh, under five mortality. They're very dramatic. The HIV prevalence, actually 2.8 percent uh, for people over the age of 15 in Ghana is, is small, is low for Africa. So uh, Ghana is actually fortunate in that respect that it doesn't have the high HIV rates that, say, South Africa has. Tuberculosis is many-fold higher than it is in, in South Korea. The, f the number of physicians per 10,000 population, 16 in South Korea, one per 10,000 in uh, Ghana. And total expenditures on health, this is something I really find interesting. They're spending the same proportion of their gross domestic product on health in both places. And so the real, real difference has to do with the economic development in Korea as opposed to the economic development in Ghana. I don't think that's the only reason, but it's an important thing to point out. Ghana today uh, is, a is a truly developing country in which that is not an euphemism. And here I show uh, an associate of mine. Uh, he is uh, registering to vote here in the national election, and here he is filling out his ballot, and there he is putting it in the ballot box. And they have had free elections for the past 16 years and two peaceful uh, power exchanges between the competing uh, major political parties. Um, they have freedom of speech, speech and expression in Ghana now that, that it, in the last 20 years this has evolved. People will call up on radio talk shows all the time and, and say what's on their mind just the way they do here maybe even more candidly than they do here. And this is something my Ghanaian colleagues tell me, uh, regardless of whatever happens politically in this country, this can no longer go away. People will not tolerate not being able to open their mouths anymore. Uh, the economy is actually improving, and there's a lot of good news. So the food supply in this country is adequate for most of the people. That's not to say there isn't some malnutrition, but by and large, you don't have any starvation in this country. Uh, AIDS is less common than it is in neighboring countries, spelled uh, the English way. Uh, there, there's an entrepreneurial attitude in this country. Everybody's got a second job. Everybody's got some sort of a business. Uh, and uh, every household has at least two breadwinners in it. Uh, cell phones are abundant, so communication is good. And the coverage is excellent. A lot of people have televisions, so uh, news can be disseminated. And most of the medical students have a laptop, which is important from my perspective. The not so good news, deaths from malaria and AIDS remain common. Uh, maternal mortality is high. Uh, there are deficit budgets that are still uh, uh, in operation, and they tend to be uh, externally supported by uh, European countries of the United States. 
Um, electrical power is unstable. There are frequent outages. And internet bandwidth for communication with the rest of the world is r rather poor. So here is a picture of uh, a booth. And this is in a small town, in a more of a rural community, a booth where you can go to sign up for the National Health Insurance Program, which has now enrolled about half of the population of the country. So they have not free medical care, but medical care that's paid for and graduated according to somebody's means. Uh, and it's available to everybody in the population. You don't see small children with bloated bellies uh, walking around barefoot. Uh, these are typical of the kind of children that you see in Kumasi. These, are, you know, these kids don't come from uh, a rich family, but they look beautiful and healthy. And also, when you go into a marketplace, you see a lot of consumer goods, many of which are produced there and sold there. Uh, so they, the, the, the food economy and the uh, commercial economy is, is doing well. Now, the AIDS pro uh, um, problem is being addressed by the government to some extent, but also by a lot of NGOs. And here's an NGO in a town of Nkwaka that has this wonderful sign out front that says, Control your lust. HIV AIDS is a killer. And here's a, a chicken over here reading it. Um, <laughs> And then you also see signs like this one, uh, which says AIDS is real, protect the public and yourself, use a condom. And this was directed at the police because it was outside of a police barracks. And here's a policeman holding up a shield and holding up a condom that actually looks like it was designed for an elephant, not for him. <laughs> but, now, I mentioned that communication was good. Here is a, this is a small town south of Kumasi where you see all the rooftops of, uh, of the houses here. And these poles that you see sticking up in the air are made of bamboo and on top they've posed a television antenna. So a lot of these houses have TVs in them and people can communicate. And the same is true with cellular uh, uh, towers. You see them everywhere. This isn't really in the center of Kumasi and you see a cellular tower there. But even in a small village that the highway goes through, here's a cellular tower. They're everywhere. The coverage is very good. There, that's not to say that there aren't blighted appearing areas in the country. There are. There's some places that don't look too good. And there are some people that are forced to do uh, rather difficult uh, things to, to, to make do. Here you see people selling uh, water or food or handkerchiefs at a stoplight where the, where the cars are stopped in the traffic and they're walking between the cars and uh, trying to sell things to, to, the, to the people in the cars. Now the situation in the north of Ghana is not exactly the same. The north uh, is, has significantly more poverty than the south does and you see uh, more traditional housing there and you don't see any electrical wires going to these houses. This, this, is, this is fairly rural and so um, development hasn't reached everyone. On the other hand, here this is also in the north and behind this guy on the motorcycle you can see this uh, rather ramshackle building back here with a satellite dish on it. So there's a lot of incongruities in a place like this. There's a lot of uneven uh, development. So let's talk about health, um, the causes of death in Africa. Well, the, I, I've broken down Africa into two parts. These countries that are in yellow here are places that have high infant mortality and high adult uh, mortality. And the countries that are uh, in orange are places that have high infant mortality and very high adult mortality. And there's a little bit difference in the, what the causes of death are. But this pie chart represents the causes of death in the yellow countries of which Ghana is one. So malaria is number one. Uh, lower respiratory infections, HIV, AIDS, vaccine present preventable diseases like uh, measles, uh, pertussis, and tetanus, diarrheal diseases, perinatal conditions including maternal mortality, and then the rest you can see are uh, much smaller. Now if you were to go into the, uh, look at the uh, causes of death in these orange countries, HIV, AIDS would be mo moved to the head of the class, but the rest of them would be pretty much in the same order. So uh, because of this, Africa is viewed as having a very large share of the global ver uh, burden of disease in the world, uh, an estimate, and I don't know how this was arrived at, of 25% of the global burden of disease is there in Africa, whereas unfortunately they only have 1.3% of the global workforce in Africa. So this is a problem, uh, human resources for health. So if you, if you compare the density of healthcare workers in Africa with the rest of the world, in Europe you've got quite a few per, uh, per thousand of population in Africa, not so many. It's, it's probably, the, it is by far the weakest uh, continent on the planet in terms of being able to field health workers. Now, this has got problems. Now, this is an association. This is, this is uh, data that's derived from uh, regression, a regression analysis that was done in this paper. Uh, trying to correlate or make an association between the density of healthcare workers and these uh, mortality statistics. 
And these are just the regression lines, and obviously not the primary data, but the, the suggestion is that there's a strong association between how much mortality there is and how many healthcare workers there are. Um, as I say, it's, it's, it's really just an association, but if you look at this a little bit more carefully, as, as these authors did, services tend to drop off very radically when you get at a density of less than five healthcare workers, and this is doctors, nurses, community health workers, public health workers, everybody. When you drop off less than that, you lose services. Measles immunization coverage is not good. The attendance at a, uh, by somebody who's skilled at a, at a birth is, falls off. So it's compelling to think that this may, be, uh, this may be not only just an association, but also causative. And in fact, when you look at these same statistics that were generated by these people for physicians, and you look at the comparison of physician density to these, uh, these mortality statistics, the, the correlation is even greater. So uh, health leadership also may be a very, a very significant importance here. So here's a map of Ghana, and I'm just uh, showing it to outline where the two uh, medical schools are. Uh, the, uh, the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology is located in Kumasi, which is the second largest city. And the University of Ghana, which is the more established institution, is located in Accra, the capital. So if you've got medical schools and they're, and they're cranking out people, why do, why, do they have this, uh, why do they have this problem of not enough physicians? Well, the, one of the main problems is the brain drain. Uh, and it's been estimated that uh, between uh, 1980 and 2000, 60 percent of physicians who were trained in Ghana emigrated. It, I've heard it said, and I, don't, I can't verify this, that there are more Ghanaian doctors practicing in New York City than there are in Ghana. And often this happens because the, these people go looking for specialty training someplace, and they go off to England or the United States, and they never come back. So one potential solution to this, uh, Tim Johnson from Obstetrics and Gynecology is sitting in the third row over here, and he was instrumental in starting this program. One, one way to uh, potentially address this, uh, this problem is to train people for specialties in the country. And so that's, that's what was done here. And, and this is the, the banner from a, a paper that reports on how this, how this worked. Um, and in fact, in a subsequent paper, uh, they determined that training people in country with uh, some elective time done in institutions outside of Ghana, just to sort of see how it's done in the rest of the world as an observer, since 1989, 38 of the specialists that completed this program, 37 of them stayed in the country. So this may be a, an important way to uh, limit the brain drain in, in a place like Ghana. In addition, uh, this is a, uh, another problem is that many of these physicians, after they've graduated, get sent out to a rural uh, post, and it's often very difficult for them to work there. Uh, Rachel Snow and her colleagues from the School of Public Health here have recently finished a, a, a survey where they, um, they interviewed 78 uh, physicians who, who have such posts and uh, to find out what it would require to, keep, to retain them, to keep them from leaving the country. And actually, the most important thing in this was uh, career development. They, they were, there was a lack of mentorship in many of their posts. They, they didn't have any opportunity for any kind of specialty training or continuing education, and a lot of them feel isolated. Uh, they were also concerned about the terms of appointment, that some of them get dropped off in some rural uh, location where they're the only doctor in town and they can never leave. So uh, there, are, there are some other problems as well that the Ministry of Health is going to have to deal with. So what about how is a medical education structured in Ghana? Well, it's based on the British system. In other words, they get three years of basic science. It includes one year of microbiology, uh, which is sort of close to my heart. Uh, they get three years of clinical sciences after that, and then they graduate, and they get uh, two years of housemanship, which is uh, like a, the old rotating in internships here. And then some people who are fortunate go on and do some sort of specialty training. Um, there, there, aren't, there aren't really nothing that, except for, I think, a family practice fellowship now in, in, our, in, in Ghana, there's really nothing that we would call a fellowship at all, uh, opportunity to do fellowship training there. There are two certified medical schools, the ones I mentioned. There are two emerging medical schools where up to now they've only been able to give the students the first, two, first three years of training, and then they have to farm them off to one of the other places for clinical training. And um, my perception is that learning resources in general, such as libraries, uh, affordable textbooks, computer laboratories, are pretty thin there. There really isn't a lot, uh, there isn't a lot to support, support learning. This is, these are some photographs I'll show you from UST, or KNUST, it's now called uh, the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. This is the main roundabout with this little statue, and here's the entrance to the medical school. And if you look down the hallway of the medical school, the medical school is a series of 
uh, like barracks with offices and classrooms in it connected by a breezeway. And when you look down the breezeway, it's not unusual during uh, classes to see students uh, around in a circle like this having a little study group session uh, and uh, trying to remember what the lecturer said and uh, probably passing on misconceptions. Uh, I, I taught some uh, classes there in clinical microbiology, and this is, this is what half of the class looks like. It's a great big room. Uh, don't be fooled by the air conditioner because it doesn't work. And, uh, and I can tell you that I had to scream there uh, in order to be heard in the back of the room back here. And uh, when I got finished with an hour lecture, uh, I definitely needed a shower. I needed a new shirt, to tell you the truth. It was very hot in there, especially when you're screaming. Also notice the, uh, the number of women. Uh, it's about 50-50, the same as it is here. And surprisingly, uh, you find the same uh, uh, gender uh, equality in the nursing school as well. This is a microbiology laboratory, and, and it looks pretty nice because the power is on, and uh, it's nice and clean here. And, but uh, sometimes the power is off, I would say maybe 20% of the time. And th uh, there, are, there are sinks here with faucets, but again, the water is off maybe 20 or 30% of the time, although the new dean has fixed this by drilling a well. Uh, there are gas uh, jets here, but uh, they're not connected to anything. Now, the clinical training is done at a hospital in Kumasi. Uh, the hospital is this building in the back that's yellow and white. It's named for this gentleman right here who was, a, I think, a 17th century shaman uh, for the Ashantis. His name was Kumfo Anoche. Uh, and here he is depicted in the traffic circle around the front of the hospital receiving the throne that the, uh, from heaven that the Ashanti kings have sat on since then. This is the entrance to the hospital. And the hospital is divided up into four blocks corresponding to medicine, OBGYN, pediatrics, and surgery. And each of these little sections is a block. So that's medicine back there. And uh, in, a, in a, a striking case of um, uh, a form preceding content, this is an emergency center that has been built and attached to this hospital in Kumasi. Uh, interesting, I say, form preceding content because they don't have any emergency physicians there, but uh, the University of Michigan and the University of Utah are collaborating to start a training program in emergency medicine as well. So uh, if you don't have a flavor of what, um, whoops, of what uh, training in a, in a hospital like that is like. Let me play this for you. It's best experience. At Confanoche, for example, and there are 140 students in my class, and we are divided into teams of 14. So for fourth year, for example, in medicine, we have 14 first year and um, fourth year students. And then the final year is also divided into teams. So for the same, let's say, team A, you have 14 students from fourth year, 14 students from final year who are both doing medicine, junior and senior flagship. That makes 18 students, um, sorry, 28 students. And um, you have one consultant, a few residents, house officers. So in a team, you are looking at not less than about 35 people. And in the morning, we are all going for ward rounds. Not to mention the hospital is not that big, so the spaces in between beds are small. So sometimes it gets so ridiculous that there are more doctors than patients in the ward. You have about five patients in the ward and 30 doctors coming for ward rounds. You don't hear much. You don't see much. OK, so there's a problem. So let me just uh, digress for a second and talk about what uh, the University of Michigan is doing and engaging in Ghana. Uh, there's a, a very large Gates Foundation grant that's an institutional grant uh, that has uh, been, uh, been awarded, at least for, for two years, to uh, develop a charter of collaboration between uh, the University of Michigan and the institutions in Ghana, including the Ministry of Health, and with the intent of strengthening their data collection for human resource management, most of this is being done by the School of Public Health, uh, and for getting better health statistics, to strengthen education and training, and to strengthen health-related research and research training. At the same time, we also have a grant through the medical school from the Hewlett Foundation that supports the production and dissemination of open educational resources. And I, I think this group has, uh, and, um, there was a, a grand rounds given on open educational resources. So I'm not going to say a lot about that today, about what that means, except to say that the idea is to produce educational resources that can be transported and used and adapted in multiple places. So the uh, e-learning project goal that I had was part of both of these projects. And uh, the, the intent here was to develop and to assess electronic uh, learning materials at both medical schools and, and to create pilot programs to see how this would work, to see if it, it, it could work 
and, and how it would be accepted. And then to facilitate, if it did, and it did, to facilitate the creation of a, some infrastructure there so there were people who could produce these kinds of materials and distribute them uh, locally. And finally, um, I helped in assisting with the drafting of um, an open educational resources policy for the universities. And uh, currently, the, the policies are being uh, addressed by the university councils of both institutions. Uh, and we're hoping for a positive outcome on that, that they approve this. Now, why would one want to do this? Uh, I had gotten involved with e-learning here because uh, any of you who are uh, uh, graduates of this program over the last couple of years will have taken the Advanced Medical Therapeutics course, which is a course that we offer here that's completely online with online seminars and online case uh, evaluations and uh, resources for, uh, for learning. So it occurred to me that uh, with problems like this in uh, the developing countries, maybe this is a way to get around some of the shortages. Another, uh, uh, the idea being it's just like a leapfrogging technology. So the leapfrogging technology, an example would be you don't put up telephone lines and telephone poles when you have cellular telephones. You jump right from nothing to cell telephones. And the same thing here. So for the students, the idea of e-learning is that it resolves some of the unequal and inadequate distribution of learning materials. Many of the students can afford textbooks, but a lot of them can't. And if they go to the library, they're not going to find anything fairly recent on the shelves there. Uh, it brings students closer to demonstration so that they can actually see what's going on. If it's in the operating room or if it's in a laboratory where they're getting a demonstration of something, they can, they can see it up close. And it improves their understanding with better visual aids. And I'll give you some examples of these in a bit. So for faculty, we, one would hope that this increases the, the, the production of learning materials because if somebody produces a program that teaches a particular surgical technique in Accra, that could be used in Kumasi and the people in Kumasi don't have to duplicate it. Uh, I, I, my hope is that this also saves the faculty time so t uh, after a while they'll be able to uh, minimize repetitive teaching class and allow for more quality interaction with the students when it does occur so that the students will already be familiar with what they have to say about a particular topic and can ask intelligent questions. Whether this will increase the throughput, I hope it does, the throughput of students through the institution or the competence of the students once they're ready to uh, be deployed in the country, that remains to be seen. It has to be uh, uh, demonstrated. Now I'm going to show you some demonstrations of some programs that I, uh, I did with some of my colleagues there. They, they, they pointed me at topics that they thought were important to have electronic learning materials uh, for, and I'll explain why. Um, Dr. Richard Phillips at, at KNUST is an expert in Beruli ulcer disease, a disease that none of you will ever see here, but if you go to Ghana, you might see it. And uh, we collaborated on uh, him as the content expert and me doing the technical work here to put together a program to teach Beruli ulcer disease, not only to medical students, but also to people out in the field because he felt it was being uh, not diagnosed correctly, uh, not uh, um, appropriately treated. And so um, if I click here and learn about Brule ulcer disease, I won't show you all of this, but I'll show you a few samples of some of the material that's in here. These are the basics. Uh, what is Brule ulcer disease? You have a little text that comes up that you can read or choose not to, as you wish. Uh, you can look at the world map here and see where Brule ulcer disease occurs or you can look at just the Africa map. There's a little uh, uh, flash uh, animation here that, show, that talks about the pathogenesis that I won't show you. Or you can see the four classical presentation of, uh, presentations of Brule ulcer disease. And I'm just going to click on the nodule here. This eight-year-old pupil presented with a subcutaneous nodular lesion, which was not attached to the underlying tissue. It was not warm and non-tender. FNA obtained from this lesion was positive for M ulcerans. A diagnosis of Borrelli ulcer nodule category 1 was made and the treatment streptomycin rifampicin for 8 weeks was commenced according to the WHO recommendations. At 0 weeks, the estimated dimensions of the lesion was 20.25 centimeter squared. Okay, and then he goes on to talk about how the lesion responded to treatment so you could have a sense of how uh, treatment works. Um, if you, to make a diagnosis, uh, there, there, we, we came up with this table of diagnostic testing for Brule ulcer disease, but also some demonstrations about how to do some of these procedures like a uh, fine needle aspiration. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna scrub ahead in this. This is Richard Phillips, who is the, sort of the, the brains behind this. Careful. To Let me go a little further. That you are going to insert your needle. 
This is usually the center of a nodule and in the case of an edematous form of Broly ulcer, it may be a weak point in the lesion. In the case of a nodule or a small plug, stabilize the lesion with your left hand and insert your needle into the estimated center of the lesion, moving three times in different directions without withdrawing the needle through the skin. Okay, and then finally, uh, there's some background on managing uh, Brulee ulcer disease. Here's the, this is the standard treatment and a link to the World Health Organization website. And one can also look at some other problems in, a, in some interactive cases. Here's a case of a pregnant woman uh, with Brulee ulcer disease, and you can click on each of these potential options for therapy, such as begin streptomycin and rifampin immediately. Um, this, this wasn't particularly advised. If you want to know the right answer, you can go this here. Dr. Silver, this case highlights a, a woman with Brulee ulcer who came in pregnant. And for such a case, which is a common presentation to a clin clinician living in an endemic community, you think of treating the patient with streptomycin and rifampicin. Streptomycin is not advisable to be given in pregnancy. So basically, uh, each of these cases, these nine cases, present a different problem in this uh, Brulee ulcer disease. Now, this sounds like something terribly exotic, but in fact, this disease is the second most common mycobacterial disease uh, in Ghana after TB. So let me show you something else. Now, uh, Richard Adanu, who's a, a gynecologist in um, uh, Accra, felt that the students weren't getting much out of coming to the operating room because they couldn't see what was going on. So he wanted to do... Uh, a, a learning program that was uh, in, intensive on video showing how the procedure is done and explaining the procedure. The, we also included in here some interactive cases, some case material to teach the students the indications and the common complications and also a self-assessment program at the bottom down here. But let me just show you one of the surgical videos. This was all done with a regular commercial camera. So after the incision is made, the uterus is brought out of the... I'm going to move ahead a little bit to show you a little further on. Just using number one Vicryl suture and vicryl is an absorbable suture. I think Dr. Johnson thinks this sounds like with, with Richard Adano and his deep voice talking about the, doing a hysterectomy. I think he once said it sounded like God doing a hysterectomy. Yes. So, as I said, this was done with a commercial video camera that was just propped up Once on the table the has been at the planted, bottom of the like operating it. table and then the zoomed down on the wound. The next step is to make a hole in the broad ligament through blunt dissection. Interestingly, as this was being done, I was using this very computer to, to stream the video into. And so it was, it was showing up on the, the screen. And there were about a dozen students in the room. The and about ligament. three quarters of them were watching the computer rather than what was going on on the table. Okay. And then, uh, let's see, what else do I want to show you? Now, this is the same sort of thing uh, for demonstrations of laboratory uh, procedures. Uh, there was a feeling that the students didn't, you know, when they had 80 students in, a la in that laboratory that I showed you and somebody showing them how to do a gram stain, they couldn't really see what was going on. So we did a, couple, we did a number of different staining techniques, and this one, the formal ether concentration technique for looking at fecal parasites. And again, I'll scrub ahead somewhere just to give you a flavor of what this is all about. Centrifuge teeth. So this is the lab technician who teaches these procedures, showing the students how to do the formal and ether technique for um, parasites. Add three mils of diethyl ether to the seven mil of the stool filtrate in the uh, 15 mil centrifuge tube, making a total of 10 ml. And you will see two layers, the ether layer and then the formal saline. Okay, so the, the, these are, um, this again, this was done with a small handheld flip camera, and then, because it's, that's perfectly good for the web. And finally, I'll show you one more example of something. This is a, um, a program that was done for psychiatry there uh, to teach the students how to do a mental state examination on psychiatric patients, and they're, they're given some instruction on this. They're given a form that downloads in PDF 
that they can enter their, their thoughts about uh, a mental state examination. And then we got some students and a resident uh, the resident, a psychiatry resident, to ask questions and the students to portray the parts of psychiatric patients because nobody felt that it was a good idea to try to do this with real live psychotics. So uh, we got a, uh, a student to portray psychosis here. Now we get to the second part of the interview. Again, I'll scrub ahead a little bit here so you can. We moved by some people, and so sometimes I just forget things, and I think I have this memory problem. How about your concentration? Are you able to concentrate on anything at all? My concentration is very poor. Yes, because uh, I have these tormentors who usually talk of coming to get me. So I usually lose concentration and I become so scared I have to run. So I don't. So do you have any particular worries on your mind now? Yes. Can you tell me how I hear them, they say they are coming to get me. They say they are coming to get So the student was taught how to act like um, uh, a schizophrenic. And uh, what, he was given some, a kind of a script to follow and, and, and told how to behave. And he practiced this before we did this video. But, and so when the students watch this, they can take their own notes on what they see him uh, portraying, and then they can go back and look at the instructions that he was given on how to, how to um, uh, behave for each of the elements of the mental state examination. So this is to help the, the students in psychiatry. So let's, let me um, return to here. So uh, one of the things we did want to do was uh, measure the acceptability of this to the students and find out whether, who was using it and how they liked it. So uh, we gave out, uh, with my two colleagues from the two institutions, a narrated animation program describing PCR. I'll show you a clip of this in a minute. To the third year students uh, at KNUST. And then we also gave out that video program of the abdominal hysterectomy to the fifth year students in OBGYN clerkship at the University of Ghana. And then each, both of these groups got a self administered survey, uh, which you can see the return rates uh, are were rather remarkable. And they were asked questions about the availability of computers, the ease, and the value of the e learning materials. This is just a clip to show uh, what this uh, PCR program was As like. the temperature is lowered it's further, narrated by the head the of clinical microbiology. The polymerase finds the three prime ends of the primus, and the enzyme begins to add nucleotides to the end of the primer using the complementary strand as, as a template. Okay, we get it. So but the thi this, this is an animation that goes through the whole process and shows what happens in, ultim in uh, later rounds of PCR. Uh, I, we got started on this because I discovered that in spite of the fact that the students had gotten a lecture on this, uh, about 80% of them didn't get it. They didn't understand it. So they understood it after this. So uh, we found out that computer ownership was pretty common. And even if somebody didn't own a, a laptop on their own, many of the students shared them. Um, and the, um, most of the, all of the students at the University of Ghana used the program they were given. About 82% of them at KNUST used the program. It was distributed a little differently. The students at Ghana, the University of Ghana, all got a disk of their own. At KNUST, the, the thing was just circulated through the grapevine. At KNUST, computer ownership did not predict whether they actually used these materials. So whether they had a computer or not, uh, many of the students used them. The ones that didn't have a computer went to the computer lab and saw it there. Interestingly, the, the students that were given uh, uh, CDs at the University of Ghana, about two-thirds of them uh, were approached by students who were not given CDs, who were part of, uh, if you will, a control group. They, they, they were not part of the study. But they found out what, what the other students had, and so about two-thirds of them were approached to, uh, to copy these materials. So there, there seems to be uh, an, an interest in having this kind of stuff. And when we had asked them to score the utility, uh, everybody said that it was either helpful or extremely helpful, and the scores on a four-point scale were at both institutions were in the three-and-a-half range. All students thought that they were superior to any existing method for self-learning. And uh, the, at KNUST, 87% of the students thought that the e-learning animation was more critical to their understanding of PCR than any other uh, source of information that they had been given up to then. At University of Ghana, 58% of the students said that they learned more from this program than they did from attending in the, in, in the theater. 37% said that, uh, they, that being in the operating theater was the more critical thing. But 58% thought that the program was. 
Uh, all of the students in indicated, though, that after reviewing the program, it enhanced their understanding of what was going on in the operating room, uh, as one might expect. So we think uh, there's enough computer ownership and access to computers to do this. Uh, the, uh, it seems that at KNUST, the e-learning animation of PCR was critical for their understanding. And at University of Ghana, this program provided uh, added uh, value to the clinical clerkship. And I'll show you what Efua Kandudu had to say about this. I part particularly enjoyed the clinical videos and the animations. With the clinical videos, it, you know, it brings on the um, added human touch where you feel like you're act actually interacting with somebody else. And then in the theaters, for example, we are having total abdominal hysterectomy, about 14, 20 of us there. Once again, you don't hear much, you don't see much. The lecturers do their best. But they can only shout so much, they can only project so much, there are no microphones. So it's terrible. So in that sense, with the OER video, for example, on um, total abdominal hysterectomy and the caesarean section, you watch it, you go to the theater, even though you're, you're so many, there isn't much to hear, there isn't much to see. But once you've seen it before, you know what's going to be done. So that if you hear this word and you don't hear the next sentence, at least you know what is being done. So you appreciate it more. So I think it's really going to help. So th these are the um, e-learning programs that have been completed there. And there are a number of others on the lists of the faculty there that they're, that they're in the process of producing. Uh, these are some of the topics. And they were all designed to, to try to fill a gap in the, where the, uh, the professors thought that there was a problem with the curriculum and there was something that they were either teaching it repetitively over and over again to small groups of students or they felt there was some difficulty in getting the material across. So my future objectives with this are to continue to support the local production of e-learning materials. There is an infrastructure there. There, there are uh, members of the College of Art at uh, KNUST who are involved in communication design who are skilled in doing some of the techniques that are involved in getting this onto the web. Um, and then I would like to conduct some impact research because I think we need to measure the quality and efficiency of student learning. We need to find out that whether the faculty accept this notion and what kind of satisfaction they have by doing this. And we need to track the use of these electronic materials as open educational resources to other Anglophone African countries to see whether some of these materials get adopted outside of Ghana. Uh, somewhere else where they might be of some benefit. And since they're open resources, they can be modified. So people can take the, the, the source material and they can put their own content in it if they want to. And um, ultimately, I would like to see some of these electronic materials, not, not all of the ones that I've showed you here, and maybe some new ones, uh, reconfigured to, to be used for providing CME credit to uh, Ghanaian physicians. So it, it, for that purpose, it might need to be translated into other platforms like uh, distributed over cell phones. So um, working in Ghana has its perils, I, I, I suspect. Uh, this looks like something I'm doing that's very dangerous. And in fact, uh, um, if, if I just walked up to this pond and this live crocodile walked out, I wouldn't naturally have walked up and lifted his tail. But I have this fellow right over here who, uh, well, I don't have my pointer, but the, this fellow over here with the stick who speaks the crocodile's language and um, I, can, I can feel confident because he's standing there and he knows what to do with these crocodiles and what to do with that stick. So uh, I, can, I can work there with confidence. So I, I don't want to uh, underestimate the importance of that guy and the, the fact that the, everything that I did was done with content experts from Ghana who identified what they thought the educational problems were and created the content for it. And there's a whole list of people here in white who participated in the production of some of these things. And then the people here in yellow, some of whom are from the University of Michigan and some of whom are from Ghana, are individuals who are involved in actually creating the materials uh, the, the, for designing them for the web or have provided some material help for this. And I want to particularly point out uh, my friend uh, Ohenio Parasem up in the left upper corner there is talking to me, who was, was the head of medicine at KNUST and is now coordinating open educational resource production there. And Richard Adano, who's the surgeon who did uh, many of the uh, uh, resources for uh, gynecology and obstetrics. Kathleen Ludwig, who's a, a graduate student from University of Michigan, who spent uh, a significant period of time over there, in fact, stayed with my wife and I there in, in our house, and was instrumental in uh, helping some of the policy issues get resolved, and a bunch of friends from KNUST uh, at, at a gathering that we had towards the end of my stay. 
And I, I have to also say that I could never do this if it weren't for a generous uh, sabbatical policy from the University of Michigan and for, for the support from these two grants. Uh, it wound up costing a fortune anyway, but uh, uh, at least uh, we didn't go hungry over there. So with that, I think I'll stop. And uh, if there's time to take a question, and we're not over, thank you so much. Absolutely. A lot, of the, a lot of the materials that were produced there were produced with open educational resource photos, uh, videos, that sort of thing that were, that, were, that were actually downloaded from the web and then inserted into programs there with the appropriate attribution. So th th that's the whole idea. With uh, open educational resources, it should go both ways. In fact, the materials that they've made, uh, as soon as the universities pass their policy and decide that it's okay to distribute this stuff, I hope we'll have it on websites here so that uh, that our people can uh, can see it, can view these. Carrie, we talked a bit about the faculty that exist at some of these institutions. Have you had a chance to explore their take on this besides the individuals that you've worked with directly, some of the more senior members of the faculty? Yeah, well, um, like anything else that's new, uh, there's always a small proportion of people that feel a little bit threatened by this. And uh, a number of individuals uh, are a, a little, perhaps a little uh, cautious of the notion of putting their work out on the web. But there are many who uh, embrace it and see it as a definite asset. Uh, and frankly, the people who I think are probably most interested in doing this are the folks at the higher levels of the university who would like to see the university become more visible. And this is potentially a way of doing that. So I think that uh, the university council and the vice chancellor are going to be behind uh, setting up. They already have a website. And it's just a matter of opening it up to the whole world. But the website's already set up to download all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Sounds like great work and also wonderful presentation. I just wanted to ask you how you're planning on evaluating kind of the long-term effects. I mean, your preliminary data are very supportive. Um, are there standardized tests? that are given at the end of every year or upon graduation or board type exams that you're going to then track? Um, are you also going to partner maybe with other countries where that, those could be then uh, concurrent control groups just yeah. to see if there is an impact, at least in terms of, of knowledge? Yeah, those, are all, those would all be great things to do and I, I would like to pursue that. One of the problems that we have in Ghana is that there their assessment of their students and of their residents uh, is, to my mind, a little primordial. They're still having them sit down and write essay questions. They're giving them oral examinations where everybody's not asked the same question. They're asked whatever question the, 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 uh, the, the examiner chooses to ask at that particular moment. Uh, so to, to do that with the, with the current uh, uh, terms of assessment, I think, would be very difficult. So that's one of the other things I'd like to actually get involved in there is trying to convince them to do more objective testing and more valid uh, testing of their students. Additional questions? If not, Terry, thank you very much. All right, welcome. Well, you did a lot there. Well, I hope so. I spent a lot of time.